Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers, Professor Catherine Blundell, who will be talking about the Global Jet Watch discovers jets from NOAA detonations. Catherine Blundell is a professor of astrophysics here at the University of Oxford in the Department of Physics. She's also the Gresham Professor of Astronomy, a chair held previously by Sir Christopher Wren and Lord Martin Rees. Catherine has always been interested in things that change in the night sky, especially things that explode. He designed and commissioned the Global Jet Watch to study this phenomena, a unique set of research telescopes all around the world to monitor explosive systems on timescales they're evolving on. <clears throat> he uses the Global Jet Watch to engage the next generation of girls in developing countries into science and technology. We may hear a little of this tonight, but first it's time to hear about explosions and detonations in the night sky. Over to Catherine. Thank you very much indeed, Val. Well, hello everybody, wherever you are in the world. It's really super that we can be together despite the difficulties of these pandemic times. Well, I want to tell you a little bit about certain things that go bang in the night sky. And the type of explosion that I'm talking about tonight is known as a nova, a nova detonation. So let me tell you a little bit about what a nova explosion is, why they're interesting, why they're important for life itself, and then how we go to learning about their very nature in some of the ways that Val alluded to. Well, let me give you a picture to start with of the night sky. This is what the night sky would look like if we were based in Australia, if there were no clouds in the sky and if it was nighttime. And as you can see, the sky is full of stars. Many of us will be familiar with the ideas that stars are unchanging, beautiful, enduring um, objects of tremendous beauty in the night sky. But in fact, some of them have very unexpected and explosive behaviour. And it's the type that's known as a nova that I really want to present to you this evening. So what do we mean by a nova? A nova is a star that suddenly appears. It derives its name from the Latin meaning new. So just to give you an illustration, <clears throat> excuse me, and to return to my image of the night sky, excuse me, the night sky showing the Milky Way here, the galaxy. If you see on the far right hand side, there are a couple of red circles. Now I'm going to zoom in with um, a photograph that I've, an image that I've taken with one of my telescopes into the region encircled in red. And what you should be able to see here is yet more stars. Um, lots of swirly emission from a beautiful nebula um, and I'm now going to zoom in even further into that little pink box. Here we go, a little bit closer in, perhaps you can uh, discern the stars a little more clearly now. In that central red circle I hope you can see clearly that there's a distinct pattern of stars. That's what this region of stars looked like when I was alerted to the fact that one of these stars was new. Let me show you for comparison, just focus on the stars right in that central red circle. This is what they were when I got interested, when I, was, when I received an alert, and this is what they looked like beforehand. If I go backwards and forwards, I wonder if you can see that one of those three stars that's in a row is there, in modern times and wasn't there when this particular image was taken, which was in 2006. This particular star that suddenly appeared turned out to be a nova. So a nova is what happens when you have a white dwarf type of star, I'll explain what that is in just a moment, and a normal star, much like our sun, orbiting around one another and then things get a bit overexcited. Due to their proximity, due to the gravity most particularly of the white dwarf, hydrogen gas from the star will be successively drawn from the star, the normal star, 
onto the surface of the white dwarf. And here's an image which I hope encapsulates what's happening. So the red orange star on the right of the picture that you can see is losing gas, which is being sucked in in a spiral manner onto the compact white dwarf at the very center of this image. This is an artist's impression, but it serves to show what happens when that gas is attracted onto the white dwarf. Things get very, very hot and there is a lot of light. Before I develop further what happens in a nova explosion, let me just tell you about what a white dwarf is. A white dwarf is what we know as a compact object. So it's got the mass of a star, but it's got the size of a planet, say the size of Earth, which honestly, by astronomical standards, is pretty small. How compact is compact? How dense is a white dwarf? If you could take a heaped tablespoon of the material that a white dwarf is, is made out of, that heaped tablespoon of white dwarf material would weigh the same as a family of elephants. So in one tablespoon, you have the weight of this family. So that already tells you that it's matter in a rather unusual form compared with what we're used to from normal everyday experience. Another important point about a white dwarf, not only is it extremely dense, but it has a very hard surface. Anything that lands onto it crashes with rather an almighty consequence. What's holding up the white dwarf, the com this compact object, is something known as electron degeneracy pressure. This is from quantum mechanics. We owe it to, to Dirac. The electrons simply don't want to be squashed into a closer proximity uh, with respect to one another. It's important to realize that unlike a normal star, a white dwarf does not undergo fusion. A white dwarf is sitting there, hard, compact. Its fusion existence happened earlier in time, but that's over now. That star that was doing fusion collapsed, and now we have the white dwarf. So if you get one of these nearby another star, and they're orbiting around one another, and the white dwarf is sucking hydrogen gas from the nearby star, it will eventually land on that hard surface and fireworks will ensue. So back to the Nova then. <clears throat> Once hydrogen lands from the star onto the hard surface of the white dwarf, the temperature shoots up, the pressure shoots up until on the surface of the white dwarf, they are sufficient to trigger nuclear fusion. The kind of temperatures that we're talking about are millions of degrees. These nuclear reactions rapidly convert the hydrogen into much heavier elements down the periodic table. These nuclear reactions release energy that increases the temperature, which drives the rate of fusion, and we get something called a thermonuclear runaway. This is something of a big bang, but not the big bang that was at the start of time, but more of that a little bit later. So as you can imagine, such an explosion, such a detonation releases a lot of energy. How much energy am I talking about? Well, a nova releases rather a lot of joules. The number of joules is 10 to the power of 37 joules. So that's a one and 37 zeros, a load of energy. Here's one way to just help you calibrate the kind of energy that we're talking about. Let me just briefly mention another new star. Emma Radu Kanu, of course, delighted many of us last Saturday evening with her fantastic match um, for the final of the US Open. Now, I don't know if you pondered what the kinetic energy of one of the tennis balls was that she hit, but I reckon that the order of magnitude for the kinetic energy of one of the tennis balls that she whacked 
with such skill and uh, such expertise is something like 50 joules. So that's obviously a puny amount, um, not even worth talking about in comparison with a nuclear explosion. How about something rather less tasteful that has happened in human history? In July of 1945, just before sunrise, the world's first atomic bomb was tested at the Trinity site in White Sands, which is in New Mexico. This was part of the development of the Manhattan Project. I so wish that there was a Manhattan Project focused on, on averting the consequences of catastrophic climate change, but still, a Manhattan Project with over a thousand people engaged, focused on one endeavour can achieve an awful lot. The Manhattan did that in developing the world's first atomic bomb. My husband and I visited this site some years ago, one Easter holiday. It's only open twice a year because uh, the radio radioactivity levels at this site are still, even all this time later, very, very high. Well, we were given permission to visit um, one April a few years ago, and the sand in the desert in that part of the world is fused into pieces of what look to the untrained eye like glass. This is called trinitite. So the reactions that they were able to trigger as part of the test at the Trinity site was so hot that it, that it melted grains of sand into blobs of glass the size of my fist. The energy released in that explosion was something like 10 to the power of 14 joules. And so that again is puny relative to the size of the explosion that we're talking about. A nova is 10 to the power of 23 times more powerful than the detonation of the world's first atomic bomb. That's a mole times more powerful than uh, the world's first atomic bomb. So the kind of power we're talking about is absolutely stupendous. So anything we can learn about Nova explosions helps us to understand the dynamic and the violent universe. Let me take you back in time even further than 1945. Let's go back to just a second after time began at the Big Bang. Now, just about a second after the Big Bang, all that really existed was radiation and the most basic constituents of matter. It was one big, very, very hot, turbulent plasma soup. It was sufficiently hot that the plasma soup that was swirling around then, comprising electrons and protons and neutrons, was so hot, so energized, whizzing around so much, atoms could not be formed. They just were not stable. But the universe at this time was expanding. And when things expand, they cool. And once they cooled sufficiently after a few minutes, this meant that an electron and a proton could give rise to hydrogen once conditions had lowered in energy and in temperature. So a huge amount of hydrogen originated in the Big Bang. So did some of the other so-called light elements, elements such as helium or lithium, or those that are very much at the top level of the periodic table. Nova explosions help fill the gap between the nuclei, the elements that were synthesized in the Big Bang, and those that we need for life itself. In a nova explosion, as I've mentioned, the temperatures and the pressures are so high on the surface of that hard white dwarf as it's accreting matter from that star in orbit around it that you get this thermonuclear runaway and that is what gives you a chain reaction of nuclear synthesis not just the so-called light elements that are formed 
just within at the very earliest times, a few minutes after the Big Bang, hydrogen, helium, ber uh, lithium, beryllium and so on. But the elements that are crucial for life itself, there is more to life than hydrogen and a healthy 70 kilo human should contain all of the elements that I've listed here, phosphorus, sulfur, chlorine, iodine, sodium, potassium, magnesium, if we eat a balanced diet, of course, in order for our bodies to optimally function. These elements would not have formed in the Big Bang alone. A nova explosion is one of the means by which nature gives rise to these so-called heavier elements, the ones that form lower down in the periodic table, which are necessary for molecular life to begin and form. So hooray for nova explosions and let's find out even more. First of all, how often does a nova, do we get a nova explosion? Are they commonplace or are they really rare events in cosmic history? Well, the answer is somewhere in between the two. Across the entirety of our galaxy, the Milky Way, we think that there are about 50 such nova explosions every year. But the problem is our galaxy, particularly as you go through the middle of our galaxy to the far side, contains a lot of, of dust, which attenuates the signals from from all the stars in the furthermost parts of our galaxy. So we don't get to see a nova explosion if they are too far away. Fortunately, in the past few years, there have been a handful that exploded, which it's been my absolute joy to be able to study. Now, when Val read out the title of my talk, she mentioned about the association of jets being associated with nova explosions. So let me take a moment now just to explain to you what cosmic jets are. Well, jets, as the name suggests, are when you have oppositely directed jets of plasma squirting out into outer space from a central source, which is often, but not always, a compact object such as a black hole, such as a neutron star, and, as I'm about to describe, such as a white dwarf, which is the compact object you have inside a nova. And by jets that squirt out, I don't mean something puny that we get out of a garden hose. I mean objects that are absolutely massive in terms of their size and in terms of the energy that they transport over those massive distances in space. So I'm showing you now a radio image of a particular part of the night sky. It's just a short snapshot observation, just the kind that's routinely used to make a survey of the night sky. But it turns out if you do a very long exposure, a deep integration of the exact same bit of sky, you see a whole lot more. That elongated a uh, horizontal streak is a jet of plasma that squirted out of the central black hole in the very centre of this blob that you can perhaps see here and here right in the centre of these images. And those jets have squirted out and then have just wiggled around. They've just processed at the end. When I say a long distance here, the structure that you're looking at, the jets that you're looking at, are over one million light years in extent. And a light year is the distance that a photon, a quantum of light, can travel in one year. And light travels really, really fast. So um, believe me, these distances, these, the extent of these jets, is absolutely huge. And there are ever so many of these. Here's another beautiful example, image by my friend Lakshmi Sarapelli, um, based in India. This is one I imaged, it's a quasar. It's over a million light years in extent. If you zoom in on this bottom shock structure, then what you see is these um, 
this sort of red and blue region here, and you can stuff in three lots of the Milky Way galaxy if you cram them in sideways into this shock structure here, which is at the end of one of these uh, jetted structures that is over a million light years in extent. These jet structures are all over space. They are the means by which a black hole can lose energy, matter, momentum via means that are still the active questions that researchers are working on the world over today. These are some more images that I made myself um, a few years back, all extragalactic quasars that we're looking at on the current image. This is another image that I made myself of a radio jetted source this time in our galaxy. I made it with the Very Large Array radio telescope, which is the radio telescope that starred in the movie Contact with Jodie Foster. And the zigzag curly corkscrew uh, uh, um, structure that we see here corresponds to jets of emission squirting out from near a black hole about an axis that wiggles around that processes in space. And the details of this structure that you can see arise because of some beautiful special relativistic effects, which are super fun, super fun to explain. I explain these to my physics undergraduates who attend my special relativity lectures in Michaelmas term. Now it's super fun studying jets. It's really good fun and very instructive to study these radio these jets at radio wavelengths with telescopes like the Very Large Array, the VLA. But the problem with doing that is, if you want to use the Very Large Array radio telescope, other astronomers all around the world want to make similar investigations to pursue their own programmes of research. I began to realise some years ago that it was possible to study these objects not just in the radio, but to study them at optical wavelengths via spectroscopy. And so this led me to set up the project that Val referred to in her introduction. The Global Jet Watch is a globally distributed project that I designed precisely to monitor the successive attraction and expulsion of matter in the vicinity of black holes. What does the Global Jet Watch look like? Well, I can't take an image of all of it, um, but I can show you this cartoon, which represents the five telescopes of the Global Jet Watch, separated in longitude around the globe so that I can do round the clock astronomy, round the clock monitoring of important objects in the night sky. This has been a wonderful joy and a dream come true for me as I pursue my research. This is the top end of the telescope in Chile, my one telescope in Latin America. These telescopes I wanted to share with other people. I specifically wanted to share the telescopes with people who haven't had the privilege of an Oxford University education. And so my target audience that I wanted to share these telescopes with were schoolgirls around the world in some of these developing countries. Here are some schoolgirls at my South Africa school observatory. All the telescopes are in residential schools and so before local bedtime they have the opportunity to use the telescope for themselves to study objects in the night sky and I encourage them to study objects that change be it Jupiter with the moons orbiting around it that change every 15 minutes, which by the way, is really well timed for the attention span of a teenager. I encourage them to look at objects which change because I want to train them to expect and recognize change, to anticipate change, to measure change, and to equip them to face a world with a changing climate and all the consequences that that will bring for their countries. It's particularly important to me 
that the schools are not merely spectators in my astronomical endeavours, but they themselves operate the telescopes and they gain skills in technology, in science, in astronomy, in physics, in engineering. These are some of the schoolgirls in India. They operate the telescope for themselves and they learn so very, very much as they do it. It's an absolute treat in non-lockdown times when I am able to visit the schools, to teach them and train them and to build their confidence in their ability to do science. The amount of fun that we all have cannot be overstated. But at the heart of my research telescopes is instrumentation that means that my telescope can be, my telescopes can be used for unique astrophysics research. And the reason why that's possible is that my telescopes are equipped with instruments called spectrographs. A spectrograph contains a grating such as the one you see in this picture. And what a grating does for us is to split up the incident light from whatever star we are observing into a rainbow of, of wavelengths or colours known as a spectrum, in much the same way that raindrops act as a dispersing element for sunlight into a beautiful rainbow. It's exactly the same physics. And so with a telescope that's equipped with a spectrograph, I can disperse the light from the target object that I'm studying, a black hole binary system or a nova or a planet or whatever it might be, split it up into its constituent light by wavelength. Now a spectrum is a grandiose name for a speedometer because via an effect that's extremely well known to physicists called the Doppler effect, I can use features in the spectrum of light, the rainbow of light that's split up by one of these gratings. And if I understand what those components are, I can see and understand how they move and infer what speeds they are moving at, what the dynamics are of whatever situation I'm studying. So here is an example of a sequence of different spectra that I measured of a particular black hole system, in fact, the one of the zigzag curly corkscrew that I showed you earlier. I hope you agree that the two top panels showing spectra and the bottom two panels showing spectra have lines that are in different places. The lines that are on the left of the figures are blue shifted, they're shifted to shorter wavelengths because they're moving towards Earth. On the contrary, on the emission lines, the peaks that are on the right hand of the plot are moving away from the Earth. And the further they are to the right hand side of the plot, the faster they are moving away from Earth. And so by looking at these spectra and analysing them, I made a prediction based only on optical observations of what this black hole jet structure would look like if I could observe it with another radio telescope. And I did that, I calculated it for a particular epoch a few years ago, and this was my prediction. You can see the grey scale of the radio image exactly underlies the blue-red prediction that I made. It's an absolute prediction, it's not a model fit. And so that assured me that I was on the right lines with my interpretation of using different spectra out of my spectrographs to interpret speeds and dynamics. So that was a black hole system I'd always planned to study. It changes quite continuously as the black hole diverts the plasma in different directions according to the inflow of matter around it, attracted by its gravity. But I don't just study continuous change. I like discontinuous change and I like explosions, as long as they're sufficiently far away, of course. 
And so let me tell you about something that happened last July. Cast your mind back to July 2020. We were still very much living under lockdown conditions, many of us around the world. And so that meant we couldn't travel, we couldn't visit uh, the telescopes at all. But of course, the Global Jet Watch telescopes had always been designed for remote control from here at HQ, here in the University of Oxford. So that after local bedtime, when those schoolgirls have all gone to bed, I log in over, my, over the internet from my computer and remotely control the telescopes, whatever time of day it is my time, once the locals have gone to bed. And because they were set up for remote control, I was observing all sorts of different targets. I suddenly received an alert in July last year saying, Catherine and Nova has gone off. Here is the right ascension. Here is the dec declination. Slew there as quick as you can. Within moments, I had slewed there. I had got my first telescope there. I'm pretty sure it was South Africa uh, that was pointing at it. The particular name of this nova eventually was given the name YZ Reticuli. The Reticuli bit tells you about which constellation um, this new star was born in. And the figure that you can see on the right hand of the plot really corresponds to that central region in the spectra that I was showing you in my previous slide. It's light that has its origins in hydrogen gas, but the faster that hydrogen gas is swirling, the further out, the further separated from the central rest wavelength will be components arising, will be emission lines or peaks arising from those fast components. And in fact, what you can see is a fit to the various different lines the innermost components fitting the overall central hydrogen complex. It's a really, really good fit. Well, we didn't fit just one spectrum from this nova. We fitted the spectra of thousands and thousands of novae, of, of observations of this novae. We went round the clock and round and round and round. For the first few days, I think the entirety, the second half of July, we were just solidly hauling in data from this particular Nova explosion. And as we studied it change, I could fit the positions of those different lines with time. And you can see that there's an initial burst, lowest down at the bottom of this plot at early times, there's a very fast excursion and then if you just look at the turquoise and the pink, you can see that they wobble around a little bit, but they're very far separated from the central line corresponding to zero kilometers per second. The kind of speeds that we're talking about are about, well, they're over a thousand kilometers per second, way faster than a tennis ball hit by even the amazingly fast Emma Raducanu. And so this figure here encapsulates the dynamics in the turquoise and in the pink a very rapidly moving jet activity, which is being squirted away from this Nova explosion at speeds well in excess of a thousand kilometers a second. That wiggling around just tells you that the jet is shimmying a little bit. It's processing just like some of the other jet examples did that I showed you earlier in my talk. So having observed this Nova explosion in lockdown times in July 2020, my student Dominic McLaughlin and I stared at what we had measured and unpicked and unfolded. And we realized that we had cracked the code of these Nova explosions. And so we then went back and looked at some of the other NOVA explosions. We'd studied two others by this time in July 2020. One of them was the one that I showed you in about the third or fourth slide in my talk, that beautiful nebula that uh, suddenly appeared 
in the L shape um, in one of my early images at the start of this talk. That one and another one in Sagittarius could be completely fitted with the identical model and showed the same pattern of jets that wiggle, jets that process. And so this example in lockdown times in July 2020, in this constellation of reticulous, despite the turbulent times of lockdown, the uncertainty of lockdown, despite the turbulence, the high energies, the explosive nature of a Nova explosion, we got jets. They persisted and we, we've been measuring now them now, the one that I mentioned in Sagittarius, we've been following for about, I think, five years now. It's still going, it's still processing around. So whatever else is going on in a Nova explosion, besides the synthesis of elements that are important for life itself, besides imparting huge amounts of heat and momentum and possibly angular momentum to their surrounding environment, whatever else is going on, we now know that via these oppositely directed jets, we've got an even more far reaching means by which a nova explosion will influence its surroundings. So that's really exciting. Where do we go from here? Well, the questions about jets in Novi are just beginning. We're embarking on a new program, but another type of explosion in the night sky that you may have heard of is something known as a supernova. Now a supernova is an even more rare event in our night sky than a nova explosion, which I've been describing to you in this talk. It arises from a much more massive star than the kind of white dwarf system and a normal star in orbit around it. How rare are they? Well, forget 50 a year of which you can see a handful. We think there's about one supernova per century that we ought to be able to see in principle. But this is what the law of averages does for you. If, if, you, if you think there should be one a century, then you might reasonably argue that we're long overdue. But of course, stochastic events do not follow uniform probability distribution functions. So let's now consider when was the last supernova in our galaxy? Well, it was quite some time ago. It was back in 1604. The um, Oxford University Press had yet to be established. The Bodleian Library had yet to be established. The monarch on the throne at the time was James VI of Scotland, James I of England. So very long time ago that we last saw our proper supernova explosion. Um, here on planet Earth. I mentioned that we're kind of overdue if you think that uh, on average we ought to be getting one a century, but I would like to assure you that the Global Jet Watch is absolutely waiting and I hope ready for such an exciting event. We will be watching it round the clock. I will get no sleep if a supernova uh, should explode in my lifetime. Well, I hope I've told you a little bit about the Global Jet Watch and how it has made huge inroads, not just in terms of processing black hole jets and how they agree with radio emission, but very recent results just published this year in 2021, how NOVA explosions give rise to jets that are characterised in all sorts of other systems, black holes, neutron stars, now white dwarfs in Novi, all across the night sky, and we can study them with uh, spectrographs in telescopes in schools. You don't have to expensively go to the top of a mountain to do really important, really modern, really innovative astrophysics research. And with that, I'm going to hand back to my colleague Val, and I'll be happy to take uh, any questions you might have. Thank you. 
you, Catherine, for such a great talk. We have some comments and questions uh, on the chat box. Uh, just a reminder for those who arrived a bit later, uh, feel free to type your questions there. Uh, we'll make uh, the most to answer them all before we finish. So, first comment is says, Catherine talked about white dwarfs and then black holes. How are they related? Well, thank you very much for that question. So they are both related in the sense that they are both a type of um, object known technically as a compact object. Like a lot of physics, seemingly everyday words when used in the world of physics have a very specific meaning. And compact object means the type of object that isn't really like normal matter. Specifically, it will curve space-time, and that means that we very much have to be sentient of the, gravita of, the, of the gravitational influence that that has, because we're dealing with curved space-time. And it very much means that we need to use a general relativistic approach for certain of the studies that we're doing. Now, there are really three kind of um, compact objects that are widely accepted um, to exist. Uh, the mo the, we've mentioned white dwarfs, um, the most extreme kinds of which are known as a black hole um, that I touched on a little bit, and Val may be able to send you a link uh, to a talk that I've given previously for physics alumni on black holes and spin-offs, where I go into that in a little more detail. In the middle, in the sense of mass between the very massive black holes, <clears throat> excuse me, and the masses of, of a white dwarf, which is, you know, probably only, it, its mass would be something like one, so one mass of our sun, two masses of our sun, something like that. In between those and the black holes are something called a neutron star. Now, being a compact object, a neutron star is not like normal matter, distort space-time, curve space-time. Um, it's, it's undergone rather more in the way of collapse uh, than a white dwarf, but not so much as a black hole. A neutron star still has a hard surface, much like a white dwarf does, unlike a black hole. A black hole has a mathematical surface called an event horizon, but a neutron star has a hard surface. And that has implications for what we observe and how we observe it. Um, if, if you have a hard surface, things go crash and things heat up in very unexpected ways. And that gives um, rise to a whole lot of physics that I guess I don't have time to go into tonight, but maybe Val, you can tell me if that's answered the question. I would think so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I will look for the link to the lecture and share on the chat uh, box soon. I'll go to the next one. Uh, from a non-scientist, I thought nothing escaped a black hole. Can you hypothesize how the jets emanate from the black hole? I can give it a go. Again, there's more details on this in the uh, black holes and spin-offs talk to which I referred. Yeah. So the questioner here is absolutely correct. We do not believe that anything can escape from inside a black hole. That's absolutely right. But what do we mean by inside a black hole? Well, normally we would think of that as referring to the mathematical surface I mentioned very briefly a second ago called the event horizon. This is the surface surrounding a black hole that matter cannot penetrate out of, just as the speaker, the questioner alluded to. So we know that the jets that we observe, we and many observers all over the world observe to emanate from near black holes must come from outside of the black hole, yet because of, but yet arise because of the influence of the black hole. So what we think happens is that matter spirals in towards the black hole, attracted by its gravitation, and forms um, a, a sort of a holding pattern of material spiraling around it, 
quite a bit of that gets slurped into the black hole, never to be seen again. Quite a bit of it outside is tends to be demanded by physics to leave at great speed because if it were to do anything else, it would be going too fast, faster than the maximum speed permitted by the laws of physics, the speed of light. And so escape along the poles of the, the rotating black hole, we think is the only means possible. That's kind of a picture way of explaining what's going on, but I really want to agree with you when, when I say the jets are launched from outside of the black hole, albeit dangerously close to it. Thanks, Val. Thank you. Uh, next one. Um, sorry, before I go to the question, I will be sharing the links on the chat box uh, after I post the question. So next one is, I had understood that higher elements were made in a supernova, resulting from the explosion of a dying large star. How does this relate to element creation on the surface of a white dwarf, as Catherine describes? Thank you. So this question is really asking about the relative contributions of nuclear synthesis from a supernova explosion and nuclear synthesis from a nova explosion. There are two comments to make about this. One is a supernova event is extremely rare. Think once per century. A nova event, on the other hand, is way more frequent. We think throughout the galaxy, even though we here on Earth can't see them, there are about 50 such events per year. And so numerically, there are more novae. But in fact, there are other differences, which is that um, you get different chain reactions triggered depending on the temperatures and the densities and the pressures that are either physical conditions in which the nuclear synthetic processes are taking place. So there are some chain reactions that happen in supernova explosions, which tend to favor certain types of elements. And then those in the nova explosions tend to favor the others. Quite a lot of barium, it turns out, from, comes from nova explosions. Supernovae don't give rise to those at all. So in fact, both are important. Um, but it's super important to keep in mind the, um, uh, the numerical uh, differences between uh, novae. There are far more nova explosions than there are supernova explosions. So we basically haven't had a supernova explosion since, you know, Wadham College has not existed during a time when there has been a supernova explosion here on Earth, uh, nor has UNIV. But some of the older colleges, Balliol, Merton, um, they have existed. Uh, there has been a supernova um, explosion during the existence of the older Oxford colleges. But of course, the telescope wasn't invented then and, super, and, and uh, spectrographs weren't invented then. So I'm really hoping that one day before too long, I'll be able to use um, my telescopes um, to from control from Oxford uh, to be able to study the next supernova event and indeed report back to you on exactly which elements uh, we see synthesized in that particular supernova explosion. Fantastic, thanks. Next, um, somebody is apologized in case they missed it. What size are the global jet watch scopes? Um, I, I didn't mention it, didn't have time to, but their, ti their, their diameters, the diameter of each primary mirror in of each global jet watch telescope they're all identical is half a meter 20 inches so just to help you calibrate the imax screen from which i'm broadcasting to you tonight um, has got a very similar uh, collecting area slightly larger than my telescopes in fact so it, it's a remarkable thing you can do modern astrophysics research science with a telescope whose collecting area is not even quite as large as a modern IMAX screen. Um, but of course, what really counts is the availability of those telescopes and their deployment um, separated around the world in longitude. But half a meter, 20 inches in diameter is the answer to that. Thank you. Uh, before I go to the next one, just a reminder, uh, on the chat box, I have shared quite a few links uh, to the Global Jet Watch uh, website, 
to the latest news, to previous lectures of Catherine, and a couple more things. And then I'll also share um, a link to our YouTube channel and an event coming on. So before I go, next to the question, we have a few minutes, if that's okay, Catherine, with you? Of course, yep. of course. Next, have any of the residential school students been stimulated to go on to study physics at university yet? They have, and I'm absolutely thrilled to bits that that has happened. Um, so um, this has happened most especially in India and in South Africa. It's been an absolute joy um, that they have gone on to study. I don't think anyone's gone on to study astronomy per se, but to do physics at university or one kid at the India school went on to study physics with engineering. Um, but yes, absolutely, it has stimulated them to go on to um, uh, higher education to study physics and engineering. I really want to do my bit to encourage the next generation of globally astute, scientifically liter literate young people, especially in developing countries. Um, and it's just fantastic to see them go off to university. I wish I could uh, spread the influence of this even more, but. Um, don't have the resource for that just just yet, sadly. Thanks, Catherine. That's great. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're mentoring and motivating girls all over the world with the work. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's doing my best, doing my best. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't clone myself. Otherwise, um, we could speed things up a bit. But we are sowing all these seeds, right, with all these students and all the people that follow you. So that's brilliant. Next one. Please explain why the energy released in a nova explosion does not radiate in all directions right radially, sorry if, if I mispronounced that, but is constrained in its orientation. Looks like two equal and opposite directions. Is that right? Are there jets that are pointing towards us? We're viewing them end on. Would you, would, sorry, I beg your pardon. Would your, would, hi, would your image analysis identify them? Um, that's a really good question. So yes, they are, they're very anisotropic in the jargon. They're oppositely directed. Remember, we're talking about matter, not radiation. Radiation will try and travel isotropically, radially, if you like. But the jets are completely, um, they're anti-parallel with respect to one another. But then I'm going to use a pen to do this. On average, they'll be pointing in any different direction in the sky. So yes, you would expect to see some of them pointing straight at you. The probabilities are low if you think about the probability distribution, but yes, they should be so. What would that look like? Well, it, it, it would be quite hard to identify and discern that from just an image. But with a spectrograph, you can do a whole lot better. Remember that I said a spectrograph is a speedometer, it measures speeds. And so if you, um, the, the actual speed that you're measuring, this is a comment really for physicists, forgive me any non-physicists, but what you're really measuring is the speed times the cosine of the angle um, along which the plasma is being squirted out. And so if you change the angle you're taking the cosine of, then you'll be, you'll be changing, um, the manifestation via the Doppler effect in the spectrum, you'll be changing the separation of those lines. So in answer to, so something going really fast away from us along the pole is, is going to be, you know, at the very extreme red end of the spectrograph. So we can absolutely measure that. We're alert to that and we're ready for it yet again. So spectrographs are wonderful. You can measure speeds and actually you can measure angles as well. So lots of dynamics to come from spectrographs. Excellent, thank you. And so far, this is the last question. So please, if you have anything else to comment or anything else to ask, do it now. <laughs> right, so the next one is, is a nova from a white dwarf a special case? Do novas also arise when accumulated gas collapses to create a star in the first place? Um, so to take the second question first, no, when a star collapses in the first place, um, there's kind of no hard surface for it to go thump onto. Um, 
what what really happens because the gravitational attract attraction is in in star formation is very very continuous and so you'll form an extremely hot ball of fusion so fusion is what you will see starlight is what you will see and incidentally i perhaps should have mentioned earlier another origin of elements heavier than those that we get from the big bang at the start of time also comes from fusion in normal stars but they don't get that far down the periodic table they wouldn't go any lower than um you certainly get things like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen you won't get anything heavier than iron being formed within a normal star for that you really need a nova or a supernova so the conditions for a nova explosion the ingredients for a nova explosion really are one white dwarf star and another star to rip to pieces uh, that the nova uh, the white dwarf attracts the matter uh, from the star those two ingredients are crucial if you want to see a nova explosion thank you and this is the last one but we have a couple more uh, uh, great great uh, question what inspired you to study physics and get into space to begin with and what advice i'm collating them right what advice do you have for women who hope to have a career in stem great. well thank you for thank you for those great questions um what inspired me to study physics um it may sound a bit uninspiring to you, in fact, but the reason why I pursued physics was because um, I couldn't decide what to study at university, um, but I reckoned that I could approximately carry on the other subjects I'm interested in by myself without, without learning from a lecturer or, you know, from a, in a university context. As far as English was concerned, I could still read books. As far as music was concerned, I could still play in an orchestra. As far as history was concerned, I could still read around that. But I just didn't think I could do physics by myself. That and I found physics hard. And so I thought it would be a challenge. I, I like to do things that are difficult because I like to be able to really persevere, really get on top of something and make progress. So the advice that I think I would give to women is, is perhaps threefold. Don't be afraid of what your local tradition has told you you should be or do. Just because everyone in your family has done one particular thing, maybe be a homemaker or cut cloth in, in a tailor's shop, that doesn't compel you to do the worthwhile and important um, uh, tasks though those are it doesn't compel you to be on those same railway tracks um, so don't worry about what other people think don't be afraid of hard work don't be afraid to be excellent absolutely go for it all guns blazing i hope that is the kind of advice that you think would be suitable val oh, fantastic we even have people clapping on the chat box, so that's great. Um, I would also add in our YouTube channel, we have lots of uh, new videos, for example, a Marie Curie playlist uh, is specifically aimed at young girls who are thinking uh, about studying physics or science in general. Um, they're very short videos talking to girls and ladies who are doing physics now. So uh, have a look around. Uh, I would also invite everyone, not just young people, to join us in our social media uh, accounts. Uh, we have Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, <laughs> TikTok, uh, LinkedIn. Um, so there's no excuse not to join our community. Uh, physicists, for those who are not physicists, are a really friendly bunch. So I invite everyone to join there because you can learn a lot and also network and, and share ideas. So finally, I have one more question, if, if I can, Catherine. Of course. Uh, the question is, approximately how far from white dwarf could the normal star be at max? I'm, I'm guessing it's at maximum, right? Yes. Ah, that, that's an interesting question. So that really depends in turn on how massive the two stars are. Um, if they're more massive, you could still get uh, a Nova explosion 
um, even if they're more widely separated than in some of the examples um, I've been describing today. Um, the kind of distances that we're talking about are sort of half the size of the solar system, something like that, maybe an entire solar system for, for probably the, the maximum that I'm aware of. That's not to say nature couldn't do something bigger and more powerful than we've come off than we've come across uh, thus far, but that's the kind of size that we're thinking about. Excellent. So on that note, I'd like to thank you again, Catherine. Let me sorry, come on camera to be friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Where am I? Uh, I can see you. Can you see me? Because I, I cannot see. Oh, there we are. And so, um, thank you so much. I cannot thank see you. you now, Catherine, because your uh, slide is just so you know. Thank you so much for this talk. It's been brilliant. Thank you to everyone who attended tonight. Uh, I look forward to engaging with all of you through social media in our new uh, in our next event um, uh, and anywhere else. We we are always open to questions and comments, so please get in touch with us. And again. Thank you so much, Catherine, for such a brilliant talk. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone, and keep well until we can meet again. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.